Hello. Um, I want to talk about a, a, a major issue that I think the Lord's been laying on my heart in the past week or so. Um, and that is the issue of universalism. <clears throat> what is this concept? And why is it a ma major is issue? First off, uh, let me define to you what universalism is. Uh, there may be multiple definitions for it from, from different people, but um, it, the basic concept of universalism is that all religions lead to God. Um, it ultimately does not matter if you have a religion, if you're an atheist, um, or even if you live a, a life that is totally wicked. Um, in the end, it doesn't really matter because God's love will overcome your eternal destiny and you'll go to heaven in the end. Um, now, there are various grades of universalism, various visions of universalism that have come down through the ages. It is not a new doctrine, it is an ancient heresy. Uh, but it is uh, something that really is uh, very, very, very influential today. And anybody that takes uh, seriously the, bi the biblical call to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ must come to terms with universalism. Because this concept that, you know, all moral people go to heaven, all religions lead to God, whatever you want to call it, everybody goes to heaven when in the end is uh, extremely anti-New Testament and uh, just just so much confusion okay um, so I'm going to say I'm going to let you know about a book there is a book called four views on salvation in a pluralistic world it's a very good book by Zondervan and it, and uh, it takes three theologians, or I'm sorry, four theologians, and they argue with one another um, about universalism. Only one of them I agree with, and um, one view, I'm sorry, one view I agree with, and it is uh, argued as a teamwork by R. Douglas Givet and W. Gary Phillips. They take the view of salvation in Christ alone. Now, I take that view as well. Okay. The other three guys argue for universalism, um, different kinds of universalism. And I'll just tell you the first one is called normative pluralism. John Hick is the proponent of normal, normative pluralism, and this is the view that all ethical religions lead to God. Um, if you are a good Hindu, a good Buddhist, a good Muslim, a good Christian, you'll all eventually be saved by God. You will not in experience everlasting punishment in eternal hellfire. Um, you, will, you, will, you will go to heaven, okay? God is the God of all religions. This is the, the, this is the fundamentalist universalism, if you will. This is hardline universalism. It's called normative pluralism by John Hick. Then you have uh, then you start getting into softer views, um, what you may, may term Christian universalism. This is a really tricky kind, and, and I really, unless you start to press Christians about this issue, they're not going to come out in the open about it because they're too embarrassed about this belief. Because it's, it's very anti-biblical and goes against tradition. This, the, the softer views of what you, could, what you could call Christian, quote-unquote, Christian universalism. There are two kinds. Inclusivism. The proponent of this is Clark Pinnock. And this is the view that salvation is universally available, but is established by and leads to God. That's very vague. Okay. But um, what it means, he wrote a book called A Wideness in God's Mercy. And this is the view that Jesus Christ, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, 
because the Holy Spirit influences everyone and draws everybody to Christ, um, is universally influencing everybody to come to Christ. I believe that. That's a uh, provenient grace. But he takes it to a universalist level. He says that Christ is, is basically um, in every man. Okay. Christ, it, you can be an anonymous Christian. You can be a, a Christian but not know it. Not, um, not know, you know, even if you've never heard of the Bible or the gospel message. You, even if you've never even, the name Jesus has never even entered your mind or if you've even said the name Jesus, you can still be saved if you live a moral life and you do good works and you're kind to your neighbor, like a good Buddhist monk. Or these men can go to heaven because, they, these men say, because the Holy Spirit is working in their heart to make them good. Christ lives in them. They just don't know it intellectually up here, but inside, oh, they, you know, Christ has been working in them all along. This is the inclusivism view. This is a, s a subcategory of the Christian universalists. Okay. So this man would say that when this Buddhist monk dies, this good Buddhist monk, when he dies, he's going to see Jesus. He's going to be like, oh, you're the guy I believed in all along. And he's going to go to heaven. The biblical heaven. Okay. This is stupid silliness. Totally against the New Testament, by the way. And, um... Read the New Testament. Come on, you guys. Yeah. The the second, the third view, and this is another subset of the Christian universalism view, and this is argued by Alistair McGrath. Um, I was actually kind of grieved to find out that Alistair McGrath held to this view because Alistair McGrath is kind of a top apologist these days and a um, major histor historical theologian of his historical theology. So. The sad thing about Alistair McGrath is that he, he should know better. He should know better, and yet he still holds to this. It's so grieving to me. Um, but, he holds to a view that he calls, calls um, uh, a particularist, particularist view. Okay? And um, a post-enlightenment approach. Okay? This is really just all weird. Okay, he he believes in agnosticism regarding those who haven't heard the gospel. Okay, so um, this is really bad bad view, in my opinion, because this not only throws water on the fire of any sort of evangelical fiery evangelical zeal that a street preacher might want to go out and save souls, it just throws water on it, and it just makes you limpid and unconcerned and apathetic for lost souls. Um, rather than viewing the fires of hell coming and the wrath of God being revealed from heaven against men, as the Bible says, no, it's, it's like, well, you know, I don't know. It probably doesn't matter anyway. Lister McGrath with the particularist post-enlightenment view, is that, you know, Christ lives in every good man. Um, so, um, they will eventually go to heaven, and it really, it really, um, I don't know. I mean, all judgment is up to God. I mean, after all, Romans 14, only God is our judge. So, when um, non-Christians die, especially good Buddhist people, or good Hindu people like Gandhi, die without faith in Christ he's like well, I don't know I mean when Gandhi saw Christ at the judgment seat I don't know if he got let into heaven or not this man hasn't even studied the Bible I am so like um, shocked that Alistair McGrath but I guess that's what happens when you spend most of your life studying church history rather than the Bible and that's what Alistair McGrath has done um, he he's more knows church history better than the Bible. Sad, because church history should draw you to the Bible, but did not. He's not sticking to the New Testament message. And then the the fourth view is that you know uh, 
Christ alone is the only way to be saved. You need to know by revelation, by faith, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah prophesied by Isaiah 53. You need to know that he bore the sins of the world. You need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. You need to know it up here, believe it in here, and say it with your mouth. If you believe in your heart, Jesus Christ raised from the dead, and you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. So you have to know it and say it. Okay. This means you have to have revelation of Christ. Okay, And for those who would oppose and say, Well, what about the people in the tribes in the jungles and in Africa who have never heard the gospel? You don't get it. The gospel is a revelation. It's a supernatural experience that can happen to anybody. God is real. He's not a philosophy to be debated. He's real. Here's his story. I was in India, because my wife and I went in response to a vision, which was a revelation. We went to a vision, we went by a vision, and we went to India for almost about a month. Towards the end of our, um, towards the end of our, our time in India, I spent, um, we spent time in the apartment of an Indian pastor named Austin. He told me a story of a man he knew who had turned into an evangelist, who was an Indian. He was a native Indian, and he was involved in black magic. Well, it was the custom of this black magic guru to go out to a cemetery in, in rural India and meditate at that cemetery to contact his god and experience his god and have visions of his god. Well, one night he was out meditating at the cemetery and Jesus Christ himself appeared to him in an apparition vision and handed him a Bible. And that man got saved off reading that Bible. And now I understand that man is a evangelist, a gospel evangelist in India to this day. You don't have to hear a missionary in order to get saved. Jesus Christ himself can appear to you in an apparition. Or an angel can. Or a saint from heaven can come. Uh, so, uh, you have to get a vision. This is how Apostle Paul got saved. No missionary came to the Apostle Paul and knocked him off his horse on the road to Damascus. It was Jesus Christ himself who did it. And, and Paul says in Galatians and in other scriptures that it was, it was Jesus Christ himself through apparition experiences and visions and probably dreams that, that, that Paul understood the gospel as it's explained in Romans and Galatians. It was a revelation, supernatural experience. Okay? So that knocks all of this universalism stupid stuff out of the way. Okay? And the revelation is this. Jesus is the only way, truth, and life. And no one comes unto the Father but by Him. And there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved but by the name of Jesus. Why? Because it is He alone, the Son of God, who died on the cross for our sins and was able to be a mediator between us and God because He was both God and man at the same time. Do you understand that? You must get a revelation of it. If you're going to stay in a realm of philosophy and rationalism and reason, you're never going to get it. And that's the problem with all these universalists. They're all philosophy be people. They're not quoting their Bibles like they ought to. They twist the scriptures to, to fit their own rationalistic, well, I've got to deal with this ethical problem. How do good people go to hell? Well, well, Jesus, the Bible says, no one is good. People can look good on the outside, but in their hearts, they're full of dead men's bones. That's in the Old and the New Testaments. It's concept. Original sin. And practical sin. You think Gandhi was good because he united India and did political stuff. But nobody knows the bad stuff in his life? In his heart? In his mind? Don't look at Oprah and think, oh, that's a good woman. You know she's going to heaven. When in her heart, she's an adulteress. 
She she has no atonement of Jesus Christ being applied to her life. She's not living by repentance. You can only be righteous by the help of the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. And 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 and, and I consider myself righteous only in a certain degree, a very small degree, by the gift of the Holy Spirit. It, so when you use the word righteousness it's in the Christian sense, it should always be in the imperfect righteousness, a progressive righteousness, a growing in goodness. But never the, the even this growth in goodness doesn't get us to heaven. It's part of our journey to heaven. It's not it is not it, the only thing that opens up the gate to start the whole process is explicit revelation knowledge and faith in Jesus Christ's death on the cross, receiving the punishment for the sins of the world. Universalism can't accept that. Looks at the good Hindu, the good Buddhist, the good Muslim, totally without the atonement of Christ. So, this is what's going on. You've got, you've got all outright pluralism, where people just accept whatever religion. Then you've got Christians that are confused. I don't know what's going to happen to the good Muslim, the good Buddhist on Judgment Day. And you've got the good Christian, uh, other Christians who think, well, what if the Holy Spirit influences the good Muslim, the good Buddhist, and they all go to heaven? It's stupid! If this were the case, the book of Acts never would have been written. The entire book of Acts was based on the, upon the premise that there's a whole bunch of lost Greek pagans all over the place. we got to convert them into Christians. Read the book of Acts. There's so much confusion these days. So what is universalism? It's the concept, generally speaking, that there is no hell, there maybe is no hell, or if there is a hell, it's just a it's just a, like a really depressing place in the center of the earth, where there's no fire, and it's certainly not eternal. It's kind of like a little prison where people go to, where they're depressed for a while. But God, in his and his non-judgmental love, eventually brings them into heaven. This is stupid, totally non totally without any concept of the criminal justice system of God, which is which is outlaid in the Gospel of Jesus Christ in Romans and Galatians. No concept of the criminal justice system of God. Okay? It's just based on confusion and um, moral pagans. Again, morals doesn't lead to heaven. It's the atonement, the, the, the cross that leads to heaven. But only, only, uh, only moral, uh, only Christians living a moral life within the shadow, within the light of the cross, does does moral life even make any sense? Okay. Okay. Why is this an issue now? I don't really know. I mean, you can look at it from a historical point of view. Where does where does universalism come from? I can tell you that when John Wesley and George Whitfield were going around preaching the gospel in the 1730s and 1740s. Um, there was a man that they knew. Um, I forget his name, but uh, I want to know his name now. Uh, he, I'm not going to warn Father. He um, he went around in open air preaching with George Whitfield for a, for a long time, and. Uh, eventually became a universalist. And so it's at least that old. Within the evangelical realm, universalist churches have existed in America since the 1700s. Now we have all kinds of, we have the Unitarian Universalist Church, but again, it's not, this, this is not just organizations we're talking about. We're talking about a, a concept that is all over these churches, all over kinds, all kinds of churches that don't label themselves Unitarian Universalists. The latest mag manifestation of the, well, I don't know, you know, if the good Buddhist, good Jew is going to go to heaven or not. I don't know. That's up to God. At the Elysian McGrath view, Rob Bell puts forth that view of Christian Universalism in his book Love Wins. It's 
it's become extremely a hit. It has like something like 600 reviews on Amazon.com, which is extremely a lot, way above normal. Normal review level is like 20 to 30. Uh, he he is really just spreading this Christian universalism stuff. Um, I want to let you know that I am not a universalist by any stretch of the imagination, and I will never be one. My the, my my experience in my life would not even be. I would not even be a Christian right now if I did not believe salvation was through Christ alone. I mean, I've, I've said before, you know, I got saved because the fear of the law got put into me when I broke into a, a middle school when I was a, a middle schooler, and then I understood the justice of God, and I repented of my sins because I feared hell and I feared righteous punishment. I mean, this is Christ alone here. Um, I would not even, my, the only foundation of my life, my thinking, my marriage, would not even exist if I did not believe salvation was through Christ alone. John Wesley, who I was I was going to a United Methodist Church at the time that this happened, although uh, the God, I cannot rightfully say that the you know, United Methodists ever preached the gospel, but um, John Wesley was the founder of the early Methodists, which was a completely different group, and um, in the, in the 1700s, Wesley, the God, God has revealed to me, I believe, in a dream, this year, that um, this very powerful dream I had, where I saw this book. I saw this book here. It's called The Way to Heaven: The Gospel According to John Wesley by Steve Harper. It's a very short book, and I saw that book in a dream, and I felt, I felt that God was showing me this is the gospel John this is the gospel the gospel according to John Wesley um so and uh, I agree I agree it is it is and now um I I've called my website um wesleygospel.com because I believe that's the overarching theme of whatever ministry God would have me to walk in in my life the gospel according to John Wesley. What John Wesley viewed as the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is what I view as the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I know this by experience. Um, not just because it makes sense up here, but because it makes sense in here, and it makes sense in my life as I have experienced it. Wesley is not a universalist. He was not a universalist. And um, I can prove that to you by referring to you to one of his letters that he wrote in the year 1756. Okay. There are United Methodist theologians today, such as Randy Maddox and others, who say that John Wesley was a universalist. No. The reason they say this is because John Wesley preached that the Holy Spirit universally influences all men to come to Christ. I agree with that. That's in the Bible. The Bible says that um, no man can come unto me unless the Father which hath sent me draw him. It also says that um, I will, uh, when, if, I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. That means that the Holy Spirit, right now on the face of the earth, is drawing the Buddhists and the Muslims and the pagans um, in their life and in their circumstances so that they can become Christians. That doesn't mean that before they become Christians that they're saved. That means that the Holy Spirit's working in their life because God loves all men. And then eventually somebody like Ravi Zacharias comes along after coming from a Hindu and atheist background and he becomes a Christian apologist the rest of his life. Ravi Zacharias. So here's, you know, here's there's an example of what I'm talking about. The Holy Spirit working all over the world. Okay. Okay. So, um, but, but United Methodist people like Clark Pinnock and, and Randy Maddox say that John Wesley was a universalist. No. No, he was not a universalist. Um, look, look at his letter to William Law 
in uh, 1756. William Law was a man who John Wesley dialogued with a lot, um, and he was a Christian Universalist, William Law. William Law wrote a book called The Spirit of Prayer and the Spirit of Love. And in that book, he says that Christ is in every man. So you don't really have to worry about people going to hell. They're, they're all going to be saved. John Wesley responded to Mr. Law in the following, and I'm going to quote exactly what John Wesley said. This is in his letter to William Law, 1756. This is what John Wesley said. Jews, Mahometans, that's Muslims, Jews, Mahometans, Deists, Heathens, are all members of the Church of Christ. Should we not add devils too? There can hardly be any doctrine under heaven more agreeable to flesh and blood, nor any which more directly tends to prevent the very dawn of conviction. These are your arguments to prove that Christ is in every man, a blessing which St. Paul thought was peculiar to believers. He said, Christ is in you except ye be reprobates, unbelievers. But you say, Christ is in you whether ye be reprobates or no. If any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his, saith the Apostle. Yea, but every man, saith Mr. Law, hath the Spirit of God. The Spirit of Christ is in every soul. Spirit of Prayer, Part 1, page 63. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life, saith St. John. But Mr. Law saith, Every man hath the Son of God. Sleep on, then, ye sons of Belial, and take your rest. You are all safe, for he that hath the Son hath life. So, with a lot of uh, wit and, um, you know, argumentation, he's, he's comparing what uh, William Law was saying to the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John. Um, he's saying, no, no, you're wrong. Uh, what, and what you're saying is totally ridiculous. Um, you, you, you are a son of the devil, son of Belial. Uh, if you believe that um, Jews, Muslims, deists, and heathens are all are all part of Christ, you know, and should we not add devils too? In other words, you know, the devils believe and they tremble. The devils believe, but they're not saved. You know. Uh, so that's, that's just a stupid, stupid confusion. Um, not only that, it's anti-evangelical. There can hardly be any doctrine under heaven more agreeable to flesh and blood, Wesley said. In other words, everybody wants to believe. It's PC. It's political correct. You know, everyone wants to believe everybody's going to heaven. It's agreeable to flesh and blood. It's agreeable to this flesh, this carnal, sinful flesh of ours. I want to believe we can all go to heaven. Nor any which more directly tends to prevent the very dawn of conviction, Wesley said. In other words, this is the doc this is the number one teaching in the church is universalism. That that is preventing people from becoming convicted of their sins. This is the most anti gospel doctrine there is. If it were not for universalism, America very well may be in revival. And the only opposition Christ's church would have would be the atheists. But, I believe 70% of the religious masses are basically universalists, and everybody else is an atheist. We've got the major problems today, I think, the two great apostasies of the 21st century so far are universalism and atheism, I think. And that if gospel preachers, evangelists, want to get in any uh, success in evangelizing people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as John Wesley understood it, uh, then they need to preach against universalism and atheism. There are some good resources that undermine universalism concepts. A latest one was a response to Rob Bell called um, Erasing Hell by Francis Chan. Now his book is not about how to erase hell from your theology. No, he's talking about people like Rob Bell 
who are erasing hell from their preaching, okay, and why they're wrong. So, Erasing Hell by Francis Chan, an Asian preacher, uh, he holds, holds up the old-time faith. He says, no, you, uh, hell exists, and here's why. Um, so that's, that's a, a resource you can look to. You can also look to Handbook of Today's Religions by Josh McDowell. That is a uh, evangelical book that just kind of catalogs ba basically every modern religion and provides arguments against them. Um, arguments against atheism, probably the best would be um, Ron Rhodes, uh, last name R-H-O-D-E-S, um, Answering the Objections of Atheists, Agnostics, and Skeptics. Uh, those two books, that, that book there is really very, very good for um, uh, kind of a launching pad to get you started in refuting the objections of atheists. If you want to be, a, you know, you don't have to know these books in order to preach the gospel, but it would be good to have had read them before you go preaching the gospel. Get them deep in your heart. Because if, if people, if you want to become more persuasive, you have to realize these are, you got to confront their demons. you got to, these are, these are powers you, you have to come up against. Uh, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, with powers and principalities. People are this, these people are, are mentally strongholds, mental strongholds over people's minds. The only way we can open up their hearts to the gospel is by is by getting them to doubt their universalist concepts and doubt their atheist concepts. And I can tell you right now that the the two main reasons that I have discovered why people are atheists. Are, is, is one, they think that the Bible is full of contradictions, and two, they think that um, evolution scientifically proves that there is no God, or that science scientifically proves that evolution proves there is no God. So you're going to have to undermine this concept that the Bible is full of contradictions, which is really not true at its basic assumption, and then uh, you have to undermine this concept that evolution exists, which is, which is not true according to the Bible, and um, honest history um, because we only have 6,000 years of written history um, to say that the world's existed for billions and billions of years is, is a total fairy tale it's like saying oh long long ago in a galaxy far far away or once upon a time it's totally based outside of history so evolution is a, is a, is a concept that is not based on, on fact it's based on, on, it's based on faith and the Bible is based on faith, but it's also based on fact. So, uh, yeah, we've got a major apostasies, but uh, universalism is the is the purpose of this video, and I'm sticking with universalism right now, um, because actually universalism is more of a problem than atheism. And if you want revival to come, you need to save the Christians first, and then work on the atheists. However, I will say this, both, both the, the universalist Christians and the atheists will argue with the preacher in public. The universalist answers with, you need to be preaching God's love. You don't need to be preaching repentance and, and, and um, hell. You know, love of God, the love of Jesus. This is the universalist mentality. Up until then, I haven't really viewed it as universalist. Um, but rather I would call it liberal. But actually now I understand more thoroughly that the issue is universalism. Um, the logical outgrowth of universalism is the concept that God and love saves all men. So why be concerned about hell, right, if love's the main thing, right? So this love, love, love stuff that we've been encountering as street preachers all these years is really because of universalism theology. Street preacher gets a vision of hell. He gets saved. He wants to get other people saved. So he's like, "Look out for hell! Hell! Warnings! Warnings! Burr, 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 burr. Get out the blowhorn! Hell! Put your faith in Jesus!" And then what happens? You get two types of responses. Well, you get three. You get the quiet repentance. Oh, oh Lord, I repent my sins, and they become a Christian, and they barely, barely ever say anything. And you get two really loud responses. 
you get the universalist. It's like, no, God's not. And these are usually women, usually women that are really like feminist and have no respect for men whatsoever. So you're like, no, God's love, God's love, God's love. Uh, what you're doing is evil, evil. And they'll also say, it's okay to be gay. And they'll also say, abortion is okay. A woman can do with her body what she wants, blah, blah, blah. Okay, because ethics aren't important to these people. What's important is God's love, God's love, love. This is an evil form of love that they're talking about because this love is is not based on the righteous commandments of Jesus. It's based on their understanding of love, whatever that is. Okay, so uh, you talk about hell and you come off as hateful and mean rather than as helpful and warning them to save themselves. Then you have the atheist, of course, who um, will get all intellectual and smart and scientific. And he'll say, the Bible's full of contradictions. Here's a few. And he'll go, blah, 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 blah. And, and he'll make you, and then he'll ma name a whole bunch of contradictions you've never heard before. You might have heard some others before, but you're, you never heard these ones. You'd be like, uh, I don't know what to say. I'm sorry. And he'll be like, see, that proves your religion's not true. So he tries to catch you in your words with intellectual arguments. And he'll talk about evolution, probably. Okay, so, um, yeah, that's what you've got. you got. you got to really deal with the universalism concept right off the bat, before people even heckle you. Just start weaving it into your gospel preaching. And people will be like, uh, 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 as they listen to them, then they'll get saved. I mean, hopefully, they can become a Christian right there on the spot. Because they'll have nothing left in their head to or refute what you're saying. I mean, a gospel that really saves people, like John Wesley, um, being preached that is also anti-universalism and anti-atheism, people are going to just be like, what? I, I, what am I going to say? I need to become a Christian. <laughs> They're not going to have anything left. It's all about getting up in their mind. See? It requires a lot of study, a lot of preparation. That's why you don't see me going out preaching, preaching every day, because... Um, I, I feel largely unprepared. I, I see the great task that is before me, but, um, you know, we just need to study to show ourselves approved. Okay? I believe that universalism is is kind of like... If, if heresies could be diagrammed on a tree, universalism is the trunk. It is the root. It is the foundation of basically every religious heresy you can imagine. Um... I would like you, if you, if you're interested in knowing, look at our blog on wesley.gospel.com. Um, we have a, a "We Believe" section on there, and um, I'm just really, I'm really trying to, and I update it every once in a while to try to clarify what we believe. But it, that doesn't mean I'm changing my beliefs. I'm just trying to re-clarify um, is, is what I believe to be orthodox, um, charismatic Christianity. And we have 12 points on there of what we believe. I want to, to let you know that um, I understand that I live in a postmodern culture. I understand that um, I believe in house church, and I could be easily confused with emerging church people. But I am not in any way emerging church. Um, I, I would advocate a conservative house church um, way of life. And, um, but what you're seeing a lot these days with people like Brian McLaren and the Generous Orthodoxy, his book, you've got these house church Bible study group leaders who are interfaith, universalist Christians. And it's really bad. I mean, I've seen two, two manifestations of this in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I live. And it's uh, universalism house church. It's terrible. But I, I do not want you who are not in house churches to think that all house churches are, are full of Christian universalists. That's not true. Okay. Um, this is a new movement. Okay. The original house church movement, which is still going on today, is starting to blend with the emerging church movement. But, you know, you house church people out there, you need to be warned against these Christian universalist house churches that are emerging now. Be warned. 
Okay? Anybody that respects Brian McLaren and Rob Bell, get away from them. Get away from them. They are not worshipping the God of the Bible. They're worshipping a universalist New Age God that they call Jesus. Okay? And a lot of these house church, emerging church people, are getting involved in a movement called Chrislam. Although they don't call it Chrislam by name, that's what they believe. They believe that Islam and Christianity worship the same God. This is nonsense. This movement came out of Nigeria by a black preacher named Prophet Saka, S-A-K-A, and he was a Pentecostal healing preacher that came that had visions of Gabriel and and uh, and uh, Gabriel and Michael coming to him, saying that the God of the Allah and Jesus are the same, same God. You don't have to worry. Look, man, if I ever had a spirit come to me saying that Gabriel, he's Gabriel or Michael, I would be like really super highly skeptical. I'm not saying that those angels can't come to someone like me uh, or to a Christian, because I do believe, according to the Bible, that they exist. But I would be highly skeptical if an angel came to me and said, Hey, I'm Gabriel. I'd be like, What? Go away from me, devil. Uh, I, I probably wouldn't say that right off the bat. It would depend on what he said. But, you know, <clears throat> now, this, this very day, Mr. Prophet, Prophet Saka says uh, t that Jesus, you know, is just a prophet. He wasn't the son of God. But the God of the Bible and the God of Islam are the same. And they'll have Pentecostal style worship and they'll speak in tongues and they'll heal the sick in the name of this weird Chrislam God, this, this Christianity Islam God. What are they doing? Allah, Allah slash Bible, it's, it's confusion. This is what's going on. So this is turning into a missionary movement now. And the missionaries are trying to reach the lost by, um, in, in, reach the Muslims through house church fellowship relationship conversation, which is the general way of house church evangelism, but by doing it with Muslims and watering down the gospel so that it becomes evident that, hey, you know, there's a lot of comparisons between Christianity and Islam. We're all brothers in the faith. No, we're not brothers in the faith. We're enemies. You're an unbeliever. You're a son of the devil until you come to faith in Christ. That's the truth. So you've got not only universalists, and this is really creepy, you've got charismatic Pentecostal universalists. Ugh. And gay universalists. I know of an organization, and I think it's called the, Pe the Gay Pentecostal Alliance. Yeah. Mm. So we're not only talking about universalists, we're talking about New Age, psychic, Pentecostal, Christian, charismatic universalists. Now that's creepy. Talk about demons. Ugh. People who think that they're getting dreams and visions and hearing the voice of God, all in the name of Muslim Chrislam God. And, and it's totally what, this is totally what the Apostle Paul would have said in the end times. In the latter times, people will depart from the faith, the true Orthodox fundamental faith of Jesus Christ, and they will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Okay, let me explain what that is. And that's in the Bible. I want to tell you what verse that is. Okay, doctrines of devils. Okay. And these people can heal the sick. Prophet Saka heals the sick in the name of this God that he's preaching. Okay. 1 Timothy 4.1 King James Version. Now the Spirit speaks expressly. In other words, Paul's saying, I can very clearly see this in a vision. Sometimes in the prophetic, it's kind of hard to see stuff clearly. And you have to sift through your dreams and visions. Um, but uh, this is what Paul's saying. No, I'm seeing a clear revelation of this. Very clear. Paul said, 1 Timothy 4.1 4, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. 
that in the later in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils spirits devils evil spirits um visions dreams voices people are hearing impressions notions people are hearing that are seductive why are they seductive because they're not not because they are necessarily sexual in nature but because they entice people to want to believe oh it sounds so good gandhi all world religions we can be politically correct and tolerant and non-judgmental and loving we can all get along seducing it's not true though it's not true it's seductive it's political it's political Tony Blair, um, George Bush, you look into this, George Bush, George W. Bush, supposedly conservative Bible Christian, he came out and professed faith in his Islam. He says that the God of the Bible and the God of the Quran are the same God. Tony Blair, George Bush, Rick Warren, Purpose Driven Life, Purpose Driven Church, Robert Schuller, Positive Thinking, Crystal Cathedral, all of these guys believe in this stuff. You don't believe me? Look into it on Google. It's all right there. You are having Baptist churches bringing the Koran, no, liberal Baptist churches, but they claim the name of Baptist, reading the Koran and reading the Bible in the same church service, as if it were the same God that is speaking. This is a new religion. Jack Van Impey believes it's the end time religion of the Antichrist. Take with a grain of salt. But, um, hey, it may be. I don't know. I had a vision. It was a dream, but I, you can call it a vision just to make it sound more prophetic. I believe it was a prophetic dream, prophetic vision. In 2001, it's the most awful dream I've ever had in my life that I knew was probably from the Holy Spirit. In 2001, I was really feeling the Holy Spirit a lot because at my charismatic church, I would go into deep worship and really feel the presence of God a lot. And um, one night, I had an overwhelming dream. And in that dream, um, I was at an open-air meeting on a highway that was under construction. And there were a group of men my age, and we were open-air preaching the gospel to one another. Well, as we were doing this, Behind the, the young man that was preaching that I was listening to, I saw upon the clouds of heaven, I'm making a video, I saw upon the clouds of heaven the Kaaba, which I didn't know what it was at first, I just knew the image of it, which is a, thank you, which, which is a um, giant black tube that is in Mecca, in Saudi Arabia, and that is the holiest place in Islam. Okay, and, and, and Muslims go to that on a, on a pilgrimage, and they, and, they, and they walk in a circle around it. It's called the Kaaba, K-A-A-B-A. -A -A. It was the symbol of Islam. I saw this thing in a dream, and uh, it was on the clouds of heaven coming down on a powerful thunder. It was like... And I was like... Oh, and I just froze looking at this. And it was the most overwhelming dream I've ever had in my life. And um, next to the Kaaba on, was this huge, like, 200-foot gateway with the United Nations symbol over it. And the United Nations, as you may know, is that symbol where um, it has, like, the, uh, the, the world and then it has, like, the, the Caesar, you know, kind of like the, uh, what do they call leaf things? Okay, United Nations simply had all the international flags of the nations. So it may be that Jack Van Impey is right, that this dream was about Chrislam, it's about the one world government, the one world religion of the Antichrist. Now, is this the one that's talked about in the Bible? Maybe. Maybe not. It may be just um, another manifestation of that spirit of the Antichrist that is manifested in heretical groups all throughout church history. Or this may be it. This may be the end time religion. I don't know. Um, I do know this, though. 
that if Islam gains more inroads into this country through TV shows like All American Muslim and all of these sorts of things, and then uh, fundamentalist Islam, if that becomes the governing rule over this country and Sharia law is instituted in America, um, they will be allowed to cut the heads of Christians off in this country. And it is in the Bible, in Revelation, that it says that if you do not accept the mark of the beast, you will get your head cut off as a punishment. There's no religion on the face of the earth that I know of right now, other than fundamentalist terrorist Islam, where people cut the heads off of the infidels. So, it very well may, may be the end, end time religion, but I'm not, I'm not going to go so far as to say that. If you are an evangelist, you need to preach against universalism, and I probably you need to be preaching against this this Chrislam concept as well. Um, Joel Richardson is starting to write books about this. Um, look look into him. His name is uh, Joel, like J O E L Richardson. Look him up. He is an ex. I think he's an ex-Muslim terrorist turned Christian, and he has written books on. Um, on this topic of Chrislam, uh, and I, I think it's more in line with what my dream is probably suggesting. So, uh, what's going on here? We have a New Age Christ universalism, which is totally different. God, it is creepy. You've got people who think it's okay to worship Pentecostal. This universalism, Jesus, yeah. You know, I had a dream, another dream, a while ago. It just popped in my mind where I saw a group of uh, young people, like Goths and everybody, and they were worshiping and speaking in tongues. But I knew in my heart the Holy Spirit was not baptizing them. Some demon was baptizing them. Again, people can worship and make it look like they're all going Pentecostal and getting happy, but they're not worshiping the Jesus of the Bible. They're worshiping some mixture of God with some other devil. So you just be careful. You know, pagans, pagan religions in the ancient times used to worship very similar to Pentecostals in their style and the outward form. But look, man, you need to watch your life and doctrine closely, the Bible says. Okay? And that's why, you know, I believe in experiencing God. I mean, I wrote a, I'm trying to put out a book called How to Experience God. I am totally, fully, 100% charismatic and believe in dreams and visions and, and tongues and everything. But look, man, if you don't have a sound theology to guard you and help you discern the spirits, man, you're going to get so deceived. There's a Pentecostal guy named Carlton Pearson. He got off into Pentecostal universalism last year. Man, just look out. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Um, and look out for these these missionaries, these missionaries that are putting off this Chrislam stuff, all in the name of Christ. You look out for that. Um, and they're in the house churches as well, but they're in denominations as well. I want to end this by this. On um, on my YouTube video, um, on my YouTube channel, I put, I posted um, two videos by um, Jack Van Impey on the Chrislam topic. Please look at those if you're interested. There's a longer video on there where he um, actually posted his major project called Chrislam, One World Religion Emerging. And he goes in really in depth about this, and he, he's like just sounding the trumpet call. He believes, pers personally, he believes that this is the final Antichrist religion of the Bible. Maybe. Maybe. But, he has spoken up in the book of Revelation. Perhaps we're talking about the religion that is envisioned in, at least in part, envisioned in Left Behind series. Um, the concept now, Left Behind doesn't talk about Muslims very much, but um, it does put off the concept that there needs to be a one-world religion and the Antichrist needs to be worshipped. Um, perhaps it's going to be in the context of a Chrislamic interfaith. You know, every religion gets along kind of concept. Um, and this this is, uh, so, preach against it, preach the gospel, get people saved. Bless you, in Jesus' name.